Uh, my name is Oscar Londoño. I am the executive director of WeCount. Uh, we are a membership-based organization located in Homestead, and our mission is to build the power and leadership of low-wage workers and immigrant families. And so our members are predominantly Latinx and indigenous, and they work as farm workers, domestic workers, plant nursery workers, and day laborers. Thank you, Adonia. Good evening, everybody. My name is Adonia Simpson. I direct the Family Defense Program at Americans for Immigrant Justice. For those of you that may not be familiar with the work that we do, we've been providing legal services uh, for immigrants, uh, for the most vulnerable immigrants for going on 25 years this coming year. We particularly focus on services around survivors of domestic violence, human trafficking, sexual assault, individuals who are detained at the various detention facilities here in South Florida, as well as as services for unaccompanied minors, uh, youth in the, in the area who are immigrants. And then finally, our general family defense program is providing general advice and counsel, know your rights and other information to the community. Awesome. Liz? Hello, hello. So happy to be joining you all. I'm Liz Anergon. I'm the founder and executive director of Pulso, and we are a nonprofit digital media startup that creates content for Latinos by Latinos. But our mission for what we do and the reason why we send that content is to empower our community politically and to have uh, folks have resources for them to be more civically engaged. So we do everything from helping our growing subscriber base of almost a million users across the country to get them to register to vote, to get them to vote on election day, to get them to take the census, to help them through their citizenship process, and also to help connect them to resources like many of the things that we're gonna talk about uh, here today on this awesome town hall. And Shirley. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shirley Planton, and I'm the Chief Executive Consultant for U-Turn Youth Consulting. Uh, and our primary mission is really to unmask the backstories that lead to urban youth and gun violence in our communities, primarily as it relates to Black and Brown communities, specifically looking at the many risk factors beyond poverty and the lack of uh, male role models, but looking at backstories that deal specifically with um, immigrant communities and the many things that come along with that. So it's a pleasure to be here. And as we look at the issues that we'll be discussing today, we'll definitely look at how these issues will in fact impact um, or hinder uh, many of our youth from becoming productive citizens down the road. Thank you. So as you can see, folks are really coming to this discussion from a wide array of perspectives. So one, the key takeaway, I think, um, for this conversation is that the immigrant experience is not monolithic and that there are a wide variety of issues that impact our community that is not just our legal status. And I think that is going to really be demonstrated in this conversation. Um, so... Before we dump, jump in, dump in, jump in to this, uh, the, these key questions that we're going to be tackling tonight, I really want to take a moment to, to acknowledge why exactly we decided to focus this conversation on COVID, right? So we are in an unprecedented, and I know that this, use, this word gets used a lot, um, unprecedented time dealing with an unprecedented crisis, and really nobody knows what they're doing. And that is <laughs> okay and also not okay. And we're gonna dig into that. Um, but really one of the things that this pandemic has demonstrated are the cracks in our infrastructure, the, the, the um, large divide in the resources that are available to folks, the living conditions and working conditions um, that, people that, are, that people are living through. Um, and really it's been disheartening to see that um, immigrant folks are not being a part of the conversation when we talk about, when we say essential worker or healthcare worker or small business owner or uh, youth that's, you know, not getting a, their graduation ceremony for 2020. Um, and really our community is at the heart, if not the front lines of a lot of those um, situations. And so I will 
kick it off and this will be popcorn for um for our speakers the first question and this is a question that i'd like um other folks on the call to also think about is what are you seeing in your community so does anybody want to hop in and share that I can go ahead and take that. Um, I think what we're really seeing, um, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of misinformation. It's been really difficult to get the needed information, particularly around immigration, immigration legal services, what's happening in the immigration process. We've had a lot of challenges trying to communicate that to the community. So just to name a few, I could probably take the whole hour talking about all the things that have happened just even in the last few weeks. but. Uh, one thing that's really looming um, that we're trying to do a lot of education around that impacts many, many, many people is the looming decision uh, from the Supreme Court on deferred action for childhood arrivals. We anticipate that's going to be coming down sometime in the next month. So we've really been trying to encourage young people to renew their DACA applications now with the added difficulty of trying to do that remotely. Um, our staff at AI Justice, they're all working incredibly hard, but they're doing it from home, which is an, an additional layer of complication at times. So that's that's one thing. Um, another thing that I think there's a lot of misinformation and um, we're trying to do a lot of communication on is public charge. And I don't want to necessarily go down too far the rabbit hole on, on what it is, but because there's a need for people to potentially to seek treatment or testing, there's a concern about how this may impact them in their immigration status. By and large, uh, most people um, who are eligible to apply for a green card, a lot of people aren't subject to the public charge determination, but some are, and they're worried and, and have fear of seeking treatment, seeking testing, because they're worried that this could impact their case down the road. And then another thing that we've really been seeing and hearing a lot through our consultation process is a lot of questions around the, the support mechanisms that are supposed to be out there. I heard recently that COVID doesn't discriminate based on race, gender, immigration status. However, there, is, there are a lot of issues with a lot of the support offerings that are out there right now to really ensure the most vulnerable are receiving the benefits. And to that last point, I guess I can, I can go on. Um, I think in, in March, we started getting a lot of calls and messages from our members who were concerned about not just the public health crisis, but the imminent financial crisis, which has been devastating to all workers, right? And, and as part of the labor movement, you know, our, our concern has been that so many workers are being left behind, right? We, we were getting calls from members who, because of their immigration status, can access unemployment insurance, even though we know that system is deeply flawed and broken. We know that they were carved out both undocumented workers and mixed status families from federal relief packages. And so we continue to see immigration status as this access point of who we consider disposable to a recovery and, and who we don't. Um, and so we've been doing our, our best as an organization to do mutual aid, to provide financial assistance directly to undocumented workers. And we're hoping that you know, we know alone as an organization, we can't meet the scale of need. So what's the role of local and state governments? Are they going to join the efforts of the federal government in continuing to exclude immigrants and undocumented families? Or are they going to join in like other cities across the country and actually make sure that we have a recovery for all? And I think I can jump in right after you here, Oscar, to, to connect that point on the role of local and federal government. Uh, at Pulso, a lot of the content that we're seeing getting the most shares and engagement is actually the content asking for folks to take action and to sign our open letters and petitions so that then Pulso can take all of those signatures to local and federal governments so that we can put pressure on a whole host of things, including but not limited to um, making sure we're protecting farm workers from being deported right now. That petition that we ran last week got uh, Pulso almost 10,000 new users and that number means a lot because it means that the people in Pulso's uh, subscription service who got it were so compelled by that that they shared it with a whole bunch of new people that got more signatures that brought new people in to sign more of the types of petitions and actions that we run. Um, another action that we saw that got a lot of traction in this past week was asking for us, meaning we asking Congress to put pressure on the next stimulus package to include undocumented folks, which 
uh, all of our organizations here um, touch that community and we know like you said Oscar and like you said Adonia that many of our constituents are uh, in mixed status families and so uh, that is super important for us to make sure that the most vulnerable in this time are receiving that help and movement folks locally at the state level and nationally it is our responsibility to put that pressure on on our local and federal government to make sure that those folks aren't left behind um, so those are two big actions and we are running some sort of action along with our more light-hearted and evergreen content as we say in the media world every week and that is unprecedented in the two and a half years that Pulso has existed. People usually get fatigued when you're scrolling and wanting to get content to get your mind off of all of the issues we're talking about today, but our community is very much interested in wanting to take action from their phones, even if they can only do that in this quarantine time. And we uh, are making sure that those signatures and that that pressure is getting to the folks that it needs to get to. <clears throat> I'll go from there. I think just to add on to what everyone is saying, I think in terms of local government, you know, I often think about South Florida in general and who makes up the workforce of South Florida and who is being hit the hardest during this time. And we know overwhelmingly that black and brown women um, who do a lot of the care work are being hard, are the hardest impacted or affected by the COVID crisis. We also know we have a state, unemployment system that has failed so many and is still failing us right now. So we have folks who have been at this point out of work, out of any dollars coming into their, their household for a month now. And so we know that the call for desperation isn't just um, from anxiety. We know that it's extremely real. And the first of the month was last week. And so we continue to see an increase of calls, an increase of stress, we know that these same women also carry the brunt of work at home as well. Um, and so they're also having a homeschool. And I'm pointing to Shirley, who's also a panelist, to kind of like talk about what folks are experiencing and even trying to navigate those systems. The only other thing I'll add for this point is that I also think that there needs to also be a savviness in um, navigating these systems. And we forget that not everyone has the savviness to navigate some of these um, government systems and to do that remotely is quite challenging. Um, and so that's what we find have found the hardest um, for folks that is not only that they're not receiving any, 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 any income, they're also finding it quite challenging to navigate these systems that don't have to be this challenging, right? You know, this is 2020, we can, these systems don't have to be so, there doesn't have to be so much red tape and so much and I just think the systems are too much, but I'll just pause there and say that things are real and hard for Miami-Dade, South Florida's um, workers, especially folks who are in the hospitality care industries, which make up a, a, a large component of the folks um, in Miami-Dade County. Thanks for having us. And I think I'll jump in right after Sandra because so many of the anxieties that our parents are feeling are directly linked to what we're also seeing with distance learning and the fact that so many of these children as data has already come out that uh, minority communities and undocumented communities are going to be the ones who suffer the brunt of this distant learning and the impact of that distant learning right um, because so many of our people in this community either have language barriers that don't understand or you know that makes it very difficult for them to engage in this distant learning process we have literacy issues that are happening in the community. We have parents who may not be technologically savvy to be able to help these parents, to be able to help their children. And then furthermore, you have parents who, even if they need the help, because they're undocumented, they fear to ask for the help because they don't want it coming to their, their home. So there's a lot happening that we're seeing in the community. And I wanna say that the most of it is deriving out of the anxiety and the fear that's happening. Thank you. Um, I definitely, a, like I love that this is an organic conversation and I think it's because we've been dying to have this conversation. Um, so don't feel like there needs to be like stack, go for it. Um, I think that, so the next question is what can people do 
uh, to support immigrants at this time. So we know that there, there are challenges coming at all different angles from all different sectors, be it from the education space, the health space, the worker space, um, or just the straight up, you know, fact that USCIS, for example, right now is not, is all of their offices are closed, right? So there's just so much confusion about what's happening on the immigration side itself. So how can folks step up for um, our, their immigrant brothers and sisters? in this moment? Sure, I'll go first this time. Uh, I think that uh, we need to be very mindful that in times of crisis that people uh, want to and are better equipped to understand in their native language. And so making sure that things are not only translated in, in physical papers, but also in terms of press releases, um, press conferences, excuse me, that everything can be translated in the three prominent languages that are in Miami-Dade County and throughout this entire South Florida region. Also think that, you know, there are a lot of stipulations that's coming out in terms of the, the funding that's, that's coming out from, let's say, local municipalities. You know, so everyone doesn't have a bank account. You know, everyone don't have social security numbers just to make sure that those um, eligibility, eligibility requirements that folks are putting in place when they're trying to help folks, that they, they're, they're being mindful of who our community really is and what exists in that. I think those are some of those, um, the things that people should do when trying to help. Also, the other point I will add is make sure there's, that folks are making all of these, you know, food distributions, resource distribution equitable. You know, there are folks in our communities that have disabilities, folks who a lot of the, the people that we, um, that are our members, if they are working, they're working odd hours and can't come out prime time in the middle of the day to get resources. So making sure that there's equity when we're thinking about how we're distributing these, um, the distribution of these resources as well. And, and I think that, you know, now's a time to really be uplifting uh, this narrative that all workers are essential with or without status. And so there are really two points, I think. On the relief end, you know, we've seen a lot of solidarity among people who have decided to pledge their stimulus check to make sure that undocumented families who have been carved out can pay for their rent or their utilities or their food costs. So there's solidarity networks, mutual aid, direct relief that people should be participating in, right? This is, I think, a moment for solidarity. And any crisis is a moment for people to come together. And in terms of the recovery efforts, I think this is a moment for us to really um, continue to shine a light on who is deemed disposable and who isn't, right? And making sure that when policies are put into place, whether it's a municipal relief fund, right? Making sure that legal status is not a requirement. Making sure that with food distribution, I see Commissioner Higgins here, um, making sure that we're cognizant of the ways in which, you know, having a vehicle might be a barrier to undocumented or immigrant families who don't have access to a vehicle. So how are we advocating for local policies that are actually inclusive? And what role can all of us play in contacting our city or county commissioners to make sure that these policies are actually uh, leading to a recovery for all of us, not just some of us? I think I want to add to that directly. Um, what can people do to support immigrants at this time? I think we need to understand the, the perspective specifically from the youth is that the success of one child is the success of all, you know, of a community. And the failure of one child is truly the failure of an entire community. So we need to address it from the perspective that there has to be help and it doesn't necessarily need to come from a mom or dad, a school. It can come from all of us to ensure that children are not only logged on, that they're completing the assignments, that they understand the assignments. Because right now, we understand many after school programs that carry the brunt of helping um, students complete their assignments are also working remotely. We also understand that data has shown us that many students haven't logged on since school has closed out. We also understand that um, in, our, in the most vulnerable communities, it is clear to us that even with the device, a child may not be able to log on either because mom is not mom and dad are not home or they're bouncing around for fear of immigration issues. We found that many children that the school system cannot find, it's not because they're not there, it's either because parents are working and they're bouncing around looking for, you know, someplace to leave the kids, they don't have access to internet. So I think it, it is incumbent upon all of us. If our children are going to surpass COVID-19 and succeed, um, we have to make sure that all of us carry that blood. I often say that children fall in the middle of a square and it is church, home, community, and school. So at this point, it, fall, it takes all of us to ensure that our children are not minimized, mitigated because of technology, um, but in, to ensure that they can succeed despite the many barriers that they face. All right. Um. 
Um, Liz or Adonia, any final thoughts before we jump into the next question? on this one? I think the other panelists really hit home a lot of the things that I was going to try to communicate, particularly about communication and uh, language. Um, and I think something that's also critically important is is communicating things in in more creative ways, whether it's using infographics or or you know communicating. Sometimes this information is really is really dense and it's hard it's hard to understand period. So trying to translate that, not just in language, but maybe visually and through um, other audio video means to try to get the information out to the most people possible. That is a perfect segue for just a final thought here on what you just said, Adonia, and really what um, has been said here is exactly what I would echo as well, especially here in our local context. but just to keep sharing media stats with you all, the article in these past, what, two months now that has been most successful has been our Know Your Rights uh, content. This is separate from that which we send to our subscribers generally. And so when I think of this question of what can people do, I'm thinking of what a general person that might not be directly affected as an immigrant themselves can do is think about their um, networks and your closest network of folks and who may be uh, an immigrant if you are not one and how you can be that translator, how you can help folks know their rights, whether that be um, your local small business, your dry cleaner that you visit and you may know or not know what their um, what folks there might be going through, whether it's someone that you're dealing with daily that may be uh, your favorite restaurant or whether it be someone else in your community uh, that you can ask, hey, by the way, I'm informed about this. Not, it's not, it might not be affecting me directly, but here are your rights um, and here are things that I'm hearing and seeing. And so again, kind of like that general knowledge sharing, if you are not again, in fact, the person affected directly or are not dealing with your communities directly, I think I wanted to frame that as how can a non-immigrant support immigrants in this time and who are the immigrants in your life that you know that you can be that support for. Thank you. Yeah. And I, um, in segueing to the next question, I think this has come up a little bit in terms of solutions, right? We're not just offering here are all of the challenges, but here are the ways that you can actually concretely do something about it. Um, what are some best practices that you're seeing locally, nationally, globally in responding to um, marginalized communities, migrant communities, uh, and folks at the intersections that are, are being excluded from the conversation? And I know that um, Carson had a question in this chat around um, around how just even the, the model of using mutual aid funds as an alternative to um, government run programs is working out. And I know Oscar, um, you all have a mutual aid fund that has been really successful in my eyes, given the impact that you've been able to make. Sure, I can uh, talk a little bit about it. Um, I think given the exclusion we decided uh, back in March and early April to begin doing direct financial payments to undocumented families that were excluded from both stimulus and access to unemployment insurance, we decided that you know people can self-determine for themselves what their financial need is. Is it food? Is it rent? Is it utility? Is it social connection through internet and a phone bill? Uh, and so we, ever since April, have been able to give more than $50,000 in direct financial payments um, to more than 100 families. Now, unfortunately, um, in a spat matter of like a week or so, we received over 650 applications. And so uh, we have limited funds and we know as an organization, we can't meet the scale of need, nor is it necessarily our role as an organization to meet the scale of need. Once again, I think it's the role of government, um, but we see this as an opportunity to really um, take care of each other as a community, right? Uh, through mutual aid, but also use the fund as a way of uh, uplifting a narrative that all of us are essential and that all of us should have access to relief and recovery and that in moments of crisis, you know, uh, so often we see sort of these political lines being drawn. And so we're hoping that the people who participated in the fund, people who donated, but also people who received funding um, can actually then join a broader effort, a broader advocacy to ask for recovery for all locally, uh, which goes to some of the policy solutions that we've seen in other cities and other states, whether it's uh, in California, the statewide sort of disaster relief fund that was inclusive of people with or without status. Local cities like Minneapolis stepping up and doing relief funds that themselves um, also include undocumented immigrants. Um, 
And so there are ways in which cities and states across the country are stepping up. And I think for us, it's just a matter of, of putting pressure on our local and state government to do the same, given how many immigrant families uh, we have here in South Florida and how many of them soon won't be able to pay for their rent, their utilities, their basic needs. Can I add, Christina, just to commend what um, Oscar and we count um, are doing? I think that um, when you talk about what some of the municipalities um, are doing and some of kind of like the language around who they're going to give the payment to, um, and some are you know saying that they're going to give it to directly to the landlord, and I and I think that brings up for me again a narrative that poor folks don't know what to do with money. And I think that um, a lot of the folks who are on the panel will agree that we think actually poor folks and um, people who are living in poverty are some of the best budgeters that we know. They know how to stretch their money and make it work um, to feed their children, to meet their best basic necessities. So I think again, when you put money directly in the hands of families, we're again telling and sharing, we're, we're you know, proving that we know that they know what to do with their money, that we believe in them and that we shouldn't, I don't, believe, I don't believe that we should encourage government to tell folks what to do because they know what to do and they know what their immediate needs are. Um, so, you know, just want to shout out Oscar and WeCamp for doing that amazing work. I know Flick has a fund as well that we're partnering with. Miami Workers Center is doing our best um, as well to meet our members' needs. And I think other organizations are trying to put together their resource. Catalyst Miami had a fund. But again, just like Oscar said, the money goes so fast because there's so much need. And we're looking to the municipalities to really step up, Miami-Dade County, or, um, you know, to really step up and meet the needs of the a large population that they serve. And I know that one of the best practices, just jumping in, moderator privilege, I'm jumping in really quickly. One of the best practices that I've seen around a municipality stepping up is being very broad in the documentation required for the applications for assistance. So yes, you need to verify that this is a real human being that is physically present, and that may be that you have a bill and your passport versus a driver's license um, or things like that. Uh, and I know that the Center for, um, for Popular Democracy has been great about toolkits around that. And in our resources, we also have some best practices in our PowerPoint that we're gonna be sharing with folks. Um, and I also want to encourage folks, use the chat to get the conversation going. We are going to segue into a larger conversation, so don't worry and, and drop any questions that you may have for folks to answer on the front end. So uh, any other best practices or things that we should be doing, even if it's not implemented yet? I'll jump in here and I think, and I want to kind of take this in the direction of not just what the municipalities or local government can be doing, but what we as advocates can be doing. I think this has been a great learning process. Um, it's been challenging, uh, but it's been a great learning process as far as how we can deliver services uh, to more remote locations, to, to more, more vulnerable populations. You know, previously we were very at least um, in our program with the Family Defense Program at AI Justice, we were very much um, entrenched in doing that face-to-face, in-person consultation. And we really have learned that it is possible to do this remotely. And I know, Christina, through Ona, you've been talking about different ways to deliver naturalization services and doing that through a web-based platform and still have that opportunity to engage and really review and make sure services are being delivered well. So I think on the advocate side, we're coming up with everyday new best practices and ways that, you know, there's a lot of things that have happened recently that have made me think when, when things do reopen, how we can take some of the things that we've learned now and processes we've developed now in this time to translate it to later on down the road. And I think something else that's been exposed in this process is just the, 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 difficulties that our federal government has had as far as the immigration agencies, whether it's the Department of Justice. Um, they had been testing um, some e-filing systems in some other jurisdictions, but this has forced them to allow for some e-filing um, now in our local jurisdiction at the Miami Immigration Court, which has been a pretty big deal. And it's something that as attorneys, we've been pushing for for a really long time. It's kind of crazy that there's not an option to e-file when federal courts have had it for, for many, many years. Another issue that we see um, that I think there's a learning opportunity and some 
some best practices that can be taken into consideration is USCIS and what's happened with the postponement of interviews and the government maybe getting a little bit. And I think, Christina, maybe I'm jumping into the next question. So you might want to, I don't know if you want me to stop. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> um, I think there's some best practices that could be developed with USCIS as far as, you know, delivery of, you know, being able to do interviews remotely, what that looks like. I think there's, there needs to be conversations around that, but delivering, continuing to deliver services so people just aren't stagnant with their immigration cases, having cases move forward and people being granted benefits. I do want to make clear that even though the offices, the USCIS office is closed to in-person interviews, they are actually processing applications. We're seeing DACA applications right now with turnarounds on approvals in about three weeks. Um, they are accepting naturalization applications. They are accepting adjustment of status applications. Things can be filed and some things still can be adjudicated. I do want to make that clear, but I think there needs to be some change down the road. And I think a perfect example of that going to own a sphere of work, sphere, sphere of work is that there are plenty of folks who have completed their naturalization application, did their interview, were approved, and are just pending an old ceremony. And there are thousands of potential new citizens, for all intents and purposes, that are not able to exercise their rights as citizens because their old ceremonies are not being, conduct, are not being conducted. Um, and they keep on getting postponed and postponed. Um, and so folks who've done everything right, and you know, however you may de determine that, um, are held up and not able to register to vote and not able to you know, apply for government jobs and other things that would make them, uh, that are required for you to be a US citizen because um, we can't do uh, oath ceremonies via Zoom, but we can do like married, like we can get married, we can do a whole bunch of things remotely now. Um, so we really, that's one of the things that we um, at ONA are pushing for is to have, be able to have remote ceremonies. To and Christina, on that point, Deborah from our office actually has the stats on this. And I believe it was over 126,000 people nationwide who'd completed their, their, um, their interview and they were just waiting for the swearing in ceremony. Deborah, jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was your number if I remember correctly. I believe that was the number and it was also, the number was it's close to 450,000 um, more will be denied of all of their rights to vote and everything like that um, if this continues until October. So the opportunities for this to just get worse and worse are um, pretty high if we don't do something about it soon. Thank you. Um, does anybody else want to jump in? No? Okay, so then I'm going to go to the last question, which is what do we want to see on the other side of this? So I am really not a fan of going back to normal because as we know back to normal was not working for everyone um, and so really this is an opportunity for all of us collectively that to envision and implement things that can better the conditions of our folks when we reconfigure what society looks like on, when COVID is under control. Any so something that hasn't been, we haven't really delved in and talked about yet that I'm hoping on the other side um, that there will be some changes is detention. Um, as you all know, um, generally at any given time, there's 30,000 individuals in detention, immigration detention across the country. And in recent weeks, uh, the situation has really highlighted how the facilities are not prepared uh, to, to care for people, but yet are unwilling to actually make humanitarian decisions and release people when they have the authority to do so. So. I think one of my hopes is that through the litigation that so many phenomenal organizations are doing across the country and then also here locally in regards to detention and folks that are detained um, here in South Florida, whether it's at Glades, Broward Transitional Center or Chrome, you know, really taking a critical look as to conditions in these facilities and the necessity of individuals being there. One of the things that I'd like to see on the other side is actually the use of, and it's something that's being done across the country, is really the use of trusted messengers on the front end versus the back end. Um, we understand that the messaging is one thing. And when, it, and someone said it earlier, a lot of this information is dense. So for, for community members 
who are already in a rut, community members that are running all day, who don't have the time to sit here and try to figure out, like I read some of these articles and they're pages long, but there's great information in it that the community needs to understand and get. So part of what I would like to see on the other end is the use of trusted messengers in specific communities, because what we know is that communities, specifically um, the Haitian community, the Hispanic community, there are certain people that say certain things and they can move. Um, it, the communities are fearful of government. They're fearful of systems to begin with. So if there was a way to engage these trusted messengers from the onset to begin to put the, the messages out in short, concise messaging to get to the point of what we need versus playing the reactionary role that a lot is happening right now, I think it would, it would, um, it would eliminate or if not eliminate, mitigate a lot of the situations that we're seeing right now. So hopefully on the, on the other side of this, we, we should be able to use not just the agencies, not just translating the documents, but using our trusted messengers to speak directly to their communities via the mediums that they know um, get to the community best. So I guess, Shirley, so I guess Shirley just said, cancel all the press conferences that happen in the beginning, but we won't, we won't attribute that to you. What I would like to see um, is that, you know, I think, you know, we, there are a lot of organizations who've been fighting for workers' rights for a long time. We're talking about workers who make up the bulk of um, South Florida's economy, You're talking about restaurant workers, domestic workers, um, gig workers, to point at Oscar and We Count, and they deserve to have paid leave, sick time. Um, they, they deserve to have an opportunity to file for unemployment if, if the system goes to chaos. Um, they deserve minimum a living wage, right? And so I, I want to see on the other side, not the same old, same old, we're going to try, we're going to fight. But we know that when one is impacted, all of us are impacted by this. When folks can't work, you know, it strains us. And it, you know, the resources are not a lot en enough to spread all the way through the entire communities. So I, I think, you know, one, if we don't have the political will, the elections are coming, let's vote folks who get it, who understand what the community needs and wants, and, and let's go in that direction. Christina, I'd like to see the messaging change. I'd like to see um, uh, COVID-19 embraced as an opportunity to highlight the limitations of government and, and emphasize the advantages of citizenship in two respects. Mm -hmm. One, to occupy a rightful place in line to receive the benefits that are being passed out. And number two, to vote. Mm -hmm. And the most galling part of this entire conversation for somebody who serves as a board member of ONA is that people go through the process, people, people do what they're asked to do, and then we can't process them through to citizenship, to the promise. That's, that's un, unforgivable, as far as I'm concerned. That's, that's the most galling part of all of this. And so, so the emphasis on citizenship not only drives um, people who are here and documented into the system, but it also drives the system. If the demand to make this work better makes it work better, that would be a, an outstanding result um, uh, of, of this horrendous period in our lives. Anyway, thank you for organizing this. I've, I've I have dinner waiting. I have to apologize. <laughs> I, have, I have to move away um, if I'm still going to be married at the end of the evening. So <laughs> I know it's late. But thank you. But thank you for organizing this, and and thank all of you for your participation. I learned a lot as a result of as a result of tuning in. And Commissioner, thank you for um, your good efforts on our behalf. Nice to see you, Michael. <laughs> Thank you. And so um, I, so we actually are right on schedule. So our last moderated question um, has been had. If folks have any other thoughts, I think now is the time for all of all the folks on the line 
to really talk about what is it, you know, like, what do you see happening in your community? And what do you want? How do you want us to be on the other side of this? And I think, Commissioner, I think you were saying something? No? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, maybe I'll just kind of start where Michael left off that, um, COVID has revealed to a much larger percentage of the population what we on this call have always known, right? And when we talk about inequality and inequity, and then you layer on Im immigration status, which just makes it even less equitable, <laughs> you know, um, people have never encountered that situation or they live and walk in a completely different world, look at you like you're kind of a nut. and. And it's incredible the conversations I'm having with people I could never have had before that are not started by me, right? Like in my little progressive whatever. <laughs> um, they're being started by people that never thought about this before, never saw it before firsthand. And, and so I do think there, there's a real opportunity um, to emerge on the other side of this with some more open minds and open hearts around the fact that every worker is an essential worker and and immigration status is is not not part of that and you know so most of you guys probably know i represent little havana and particularly the east little havana area L less than half of the folks are citizens there now it doesn't mean they're out of status they but but Every family there has somebody in some version of status and not status that doesn't equal citizenship in that neighborhood. And, and the fear that was already in place around accessing medical care because of the public charge. Um, when I work with my constituents there, they haven't taken their kids to the dentist since Donald Trump became president, mm. you know, because of the fear of this public charge piece. And, and so then you put that, you layer a pandemic on, you layer unemployment and you layer that they can't receive benefits and you layer on the lack of internet access and they don't have a computer at home. And, um, and in a pandemic, our libraries are closed. So their access to computers has gone away. And, um, and we're back to paper forms, which quite frankly, guess what? In the 70s, we used to apply for unemployment with a paper form and we used to get it. So it actually is better than the computer system the state is using. So I'm really hoping that it opens people's eyes um, because such a broad swath of the population is being affected by this issue is that it, it begins to build commonality um, because what you used to think of is those people are going through, well, guess what? A lot of people you know are going through. And so that common experience may be able to actually add some compassion to this discussion. Um, and then the other thing I've been thinking about a lot um, is other than like food distribution and sort of this immediate crisis aid is how do you get an economy started again in an economy like ours where um, I can probably look up the exact numbers, but essentially we have about 85,000 businesses in the county and about 68,000 of those have less than 10 employees. And so our economy is, is very much more than almost any other county in the country really driven by these you know, as we like to say, mom and pop businesses. Mm -hmm. But when you unpack what these businesses and who are running these businesses, many of them, most of them are immigrants and not all of them are in status, but that doesn't mean it's not a legitimate tax paying, employee paying, payroll tax paying mm -hmm. business. Um, and what I've been looking at is in the first round of SBA loans and, and PPP loans, I mean, we can be outraged at the big companies that took it away, but the reality is a lot of medium and medium-sized business, a hundred person firm, a 250 person firm, which are smallish businesses got help and, and that was okay. But when you're talking about a 10 person business, they were completely left out of it. And, and so Congresswoman Shalala and I had a lot of conversations and, and that's why the Dems up there really pushed for 60 billion of the last round to go through the CDFIs, which are community development 
um, financial institutions, you've heard of many of them, the self-help credit union, Axion, Black businesses, you know, like a lot, we've got these little places um, because they're used to working with these five person businesses, 10 person businesses, which tend to be led by immigrants. And um, we'd never worked together as, as a team, those community, you know, the CDFIs as they're called, the community development financial institutions. And mm -hmm. so about six weeks ago, we just started to get together once a week. I convened them to start talking about how can we be ready for when the next round of PPP came so that these small immigrant businesses can get it. And so they are better prepared. But in doing that, that's just the crisis, right? And at some point in time, like the money's going to run out. And so we've come up with a really creative idea to create, um, I'm hoping to launch by the end of the month, a $50 million revolving loan fund that will only be for these CDFIs that serve these very tiny customers and small businesses um, because they're used to working in Opelaka, they're used to working in Little Havana, they're used to working in West Miami, they're used to working in Perrine. And, and so, and they're used to giving small loans, like $10,000 loan, a big bank can't even make enough money to process that. So we're working now um, on a project. And what we're trying to do is take the CARES money and instead of just giving it out to people, create something that lasts forever, that this would be a fund that would get loans out to these smaller businesses. But then the fund would last forever, quite frankly. And we've got actually a couple of big banks that are going to contribute a bunch of foundations. And, and I believe um, I can convince the mayor to put in $20 million. So I've been trying to think not just about how do I help the immigrant family, because um, last week I piloted the first food distribution that did not require a car. And you would have thought I was trying to land a man on the moon. I'm like, guys, it can be done. Just stay out of my way. I will figure it out. My team figured it out. We had some helpful uh, burly officers from the city of Miami police that carried all the bags. Thank you very much. <laughs> They're in better shape than I am and they were helpful. And, and we did it, but like people are so in this rut of you can't safely help people. But I, I wanted to get away from this, how do I help one family and how do I create something structural? Because this recovery is gonna be long, slow and hard. And these immigrant businesses are not gonna to go to a bank and get a loan. They're not unbanked. They just don't have credit. And so right. that's kind of what I have in the pot. Um, and so, I'll, I'll let you guys know, uh, we expect to have it, actually the mayor's helping me and we expect to have it on the May 19th agenda and, and try to get it up and running. But that's sort of what I've been trying to do is not just the person, but how these, these businesses that are run by immigrants, both documented and, and in mixed status, they employ us, right. <laughs> like they employ us and, and they have to survive too, and in part they have to survive because they may be more likely to hire people and treat people of mixed status better. Right. So anyway, that's a little bit of what I'm up to and I so appreciate the conversation because every time I'm with you guys, I learn something new. Thank you for being able to join us. And I think that one of the, so one of the things that we've done at ONA is have this immigrant powered business campaign um, it, you know, in, in partnership with, with a whole bunch of folks. And it's because we realized that there would be no Miami economy if it weren't for immigrant powered businesses, whether it's immigrant run, operated, or the clientele is primarily immigrant. And so, you know, we, one of the hardest things, as you mentioned, regarding the PPP and small business relief was that it was not accessible. Um, whether it was like the application process, the relationship with a banker, and the laundry list of things that like we've already yeah. discussed. And, and the thing is that um, one of the things for undocumented folks and for new arrivals is the way to make it is you make your own path. And that's a part of the American dream that we so fundamentally believe in. And so we are, we are cutting off folks' hands and feet um, in their ability to be able to survive. So the small business piece is super important and I'm excited about this um, revolving fund and obviously any way that we can support. You got it. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
And uh, so anybody else on the on the call want to jump in on what what you'd like to see? What are, what are you seeing and what um, are some potential solutions to some of the challenges that we're facing or what you hope for? We had a couple of really great questions in the chat. The first one came from um, Maria Paula and she asked, how can we try to align the current efforts to include post COVID related equity and access related struggles? And um, I think it's a great question because as we've seen time and again with whether it's natural disasters like hurricanes or this disease that not only are vulnerable groups the most impacted, but um, people tend to move on when um, their own life improves and a lot of these people are left behind. So how can we keep up this momentum to make sure that you know everyone gets the support they need? Anybody want to take it? Don't all run at once. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can take a stab at it. So I think that it's really important that we use this time to reflect on what what are the inequities that we're seeing that is bubbling up to the surface that is beating us over the like that we're getting beaten over the head, the head with, um, and it is issues of you know modes of transportation, language access, um, workers' rights in terms of like basic working conditions. Um, and so if we are able to ask for changes in those things now, one of the key things is to say this is not a temporary ask, but this is we're not going back to to business as usual. I'm so glad that you started off this conversation, Christina, because you have such valuable things to share as well. And uh, I totally agree with that and, and we'll we'll connect this question to what you said into the previous one around what is the world we want to imagine after this and I'll just make two bold asks of not only ourselves locally but uh, collectively so that we can continue to push for this and the first is to abolish ice uh, I think that that is a, a conversation that we need to continue to have and think about how especially in this moment um, a, a predatory entity like that one is wreaking havoc in many of our immigrant communities in this, um, in the craziness of what the pandemic is bringing and also bringing to light. And the second is thinking about how do we make sure that um, healthcare is not tied to folks' employed status and lack thereof as well with many of the communities that we're serving. And so healthcare access and um, and ICE are two places and spaces and issues and um, just spaces that we have all been working in, but that I think is important to align many of the cracks in, this, in those two systems that we're identifying now to make bold, big asks of our leaders after this. I just want to add to, um, to Liz's point, and I think not only bold, big asks of our leaders, but of us as well. Um, I guess we're the leaders too. Um, I'm often shocked at how many people don't understand what everyday Miamians, everyday folks are experiencing, uh, whether it be, yeah, there are people who work and are not on contract and they don't have paid time off and they don't have health insurance. You know, that's a lot of, though it's not a minority, it's a, a large population that are experiencing not having a living wage. Um, I think also in terms of what parents are experiencing, like, you know, having multiple kids, multiple grades, not understanding the language, not, and also making sure that, you know, during this crisis, the little that you did comprehend goes out the window. And so I think that to me, I hope that we'll become a closer community, not just living together in different parts of the county, but also knowing each other and really understanding what folks are experiencing. Because I think when it's your folks, when you know someone, it moves you in a different way. And so many of us are so comfortable with our day-to-day -day and we're so far away from folks that we don't get it. And th this is, again, another opportunity for us to get it, to see that, look, folks are struggling. They're right there. They're amongst us. They're our children's friends. They're our neighbors. They're our coworkers. And this shouldn't happen to them. Um, and it's wrong and it's foul, especially in America. Um, I, my family is from Haiti and I tell folks, my mom sacrificed, my father came here for a better life. This is not the better life. 
right? And I think America can give us more. I think our county can give us more. Definitely our municipalities can give us more. And we got to push them to do that. And so I think that bold action from us, because we make this democracy happen. And to that point, I would just add, like as an organization that's a membership base, a membership led organization, our theory of change has always been that real fundamental structural change happens from the bottom up. It doesn't happen from the grass tops. It doesn't happen from policy experts. And, and even now we see that, you know, the policy formulations that happened that allowed for um, a household of five, five kids to have to share one tablet, right, of our education system that allows that we have it personally where we have members where it's 11 day laborers living in the same house cramped together because they can't afford rent, right? Or a farm worker who's never seen a doctor, right? These issues are fundamentally issues that that, that surface this, this um, I think, this, um, this problem, which is that so much of policy is disconnected from the, from the grassroots, right? And when we begin to center the perspectives of the undocumented, the day labor, the domestic worker, the farm worker in formulating policy, right? Uh, I think we can produce a more just and inclusive economy. And that can only happen if we invest even more in the grassroots organizations that are doing the difficult work of doing political education, of providing a political home for people who are being displaced, right? Who, for whom these local state and federal systems simply aren't working and are looking to collectivize, right? And so I'm also hopeful that after all of this, right, after the relief and we go to recovery, we can rebuild also our labor movement, right? To build a stronger, more inclusive labor movement, one that can really sort of um, surface this, this platform of, of all work is essential. Um, and that all of us as consumers, as, as workers can regain that consciousness of how important and fundamental it is to have a strong labor movement for any recovery we want. I'll jump right into this one. And I, th I think, um... Commissioner Higgins said it best. I, I think one of the things that we really need to be mindful of, and my friend Sandra often says it, we need to be real about the present. People, people didn't just become hungry, right? People weren't just, uh, people didn't just not have the ability to pay their rent. This isn't new to us. And I think Sandra says it best when she says, we've got to start with us. And um, the word that I'm hoping on the other end that instead of sympathizing, because we're so good, because we're so comfortable and we're so privileged in our positions, that it's so easy for us to sympathize with other people. Oh, I hear you and we give people a tap on the back, but we don't empathize with them, right? And until we begin to get to the point where we say, this could easily be me, tomorrow morning, I may be the one that doesn't have some place to stay. I may be the hungry one. I may be the one without a job. We don't understand the work, the life and, and the, what people are living. I have young people that say to me, miss, I'm not living. I'm just trying to survive out here. Right. And that's a, that's a powerful statement. What a young kid says to you, because they tell you, I don't know where I'm going to rest my head. A hungry child doesn't know two plus two and three plus three. Uh, a kid that doesn't know where he's going to lay his head, whether or not when they come from school, their parents, their immigrant parents, undocumented parents are going to be there to receive them. Those things don't matter. And it only emphasizes the, the disparities, the educational disparities, right? The disparities that are in our, in our communities. But the other point that I really wanted to make is as we talk about these communities, um, we need to be mindful that these same communities that are barely trying to survive here are taking care of an entire other family back at home. So I too am of Haitian descent. And I can tell you that there are many families that get a $300 paycheck and they're sending 150 of it home you know, trying to make sure that another sibling is going to school. Another family member has some money to be able to go to a hospital or go see a doctor. So indeed we are interconnected. And that's something that I think we, should, we, we must be mindful of when we talk about these communities, never to forget that they're bigger than what we see here. Thank you for bringing that home. I think um, interconnectedness is, is a common thread. And I think that um, the only way for us to, to implement or envision or remedy what is happening is for us to do it together. And every single person has a, a role to play and a responsibility. Um, and it's not to say that there isn't a role for government, but there is a role for individuals. I, with my dollar, can decide how I'm going to spend um, the money that I have to support businesses that, li that work and live my values, right? Um, I also have... I am in a position where I'm in a position of leadership. I can decide the work practices that are going to be made in my workplace. We all have that 
um, that ability if we're in a, in a supervisory or decision-making role. Um, and so I would like to open it up to non-panelists. Do you, does anybody have any burning thoughts? I know that the, the chat got a little active. Um, so I don't know, Lily, Maria, Charo, Carson, I'm just pulling the people that are on the chat who I also happen to know. Uh, would you like to share anything? Yes, I did totally call you out. I just think this panel is great. I definitely feel like we're in good hands. Um, this is Lily Hartman. I'm also at AI Justice, like Adonia and Mackenzie and others. Um, but I'm working on some of the litigation that was filed to get people out of ICE custody. Um, and I, I think in some ways it's been a good moment to see collaboration that sometimes doesn't happen between legal service organizations and other groups in the community. Um, but, you know, we have friends and in, in, in organizations these days that do more mutual aid type work with people in custody who have really um, helped us out. You know, we've hit a lot of walls. Um, so a lot of it has been discouraging, but um, I think, it, yeah, it's really clarified in a lot of people's mind that, you know, detention um, and prisons and all of them need to, need to end and be closed. Um, you know, and a lot of the work that we're doing in the ICE side is being mirrored by efforts by CJP, Dream Defenders, and others who are fighting against Metro West, especially, um, you know, given the skyrocketing numbers of cases there and the death even this week. Um, so I think it's important to bring that into this conversation too, especially because not many of those orgs are on this call. Christina, I would, um... I would love to to sort of just make a statement about, you know, despite all of the things that feel incredibly overwhelming and and um, almost unreachable goals at times, just by how how huge all of this seems. Being on a call like this, as someone who doesn't do this type of work for a living, as just someone who cares, who wants, someone who wants to support a you in what you do um, as someone who absolutely values the work um, that so many of you are doing this is this is a moment that it is so evident and um, I hope this is being recorded because it is so evident how impactful how incredibly powerful we are together um, it is uplifting to hear so many of you speak of the work you do, but also how you speak of the work you do and how much you care. Um, and so as someone that is outside of, of the system, someone that is outside of the day-to-day -day in this, I, I applaud you all for the work. I applaud, applaud you all for the weight that you carry on behalf of so many. Um, and I just wanna say that out loud. Um, so thank you, all of you. Oh, thank you, Maria. <laughs> Anybody else want to share? Joanna, I think. Oh, I came online. Sorry, I was eating dinner, or I think it was actually lunch um, when we started. Um, but I wanted to show my face. I'm a board member of AI Justice, and I'm not surprised at all about how great Adonia has done and, and Lily and other people that are here for the organization. But on behalf of my board, I, we try and tell them that all the time, but I'm so impressed by this entire group. I didn't know about a lot of these organizations. I'm relatively, relatively new to Miami. Um, and I just am uh, inspired and comforted by the, um, the uh, picking back on, piggybacking on what Maria Paula said, just the dedication and the compassion and um, everything that you guys are throwing into this at such a hard time. It's really, um, it's really inspiring and um, makes me feel a lot better about what's uh, on the other side of this. And so thank you all. I know if, if we're all sacrificing, I know how much you guys are sacrificing um, because you've already made a huge personal sacrifice to take jobs working in these kinds of organizations where you're not doing it for the big bucks. And so thank you. Thank you um, for everything you're doing and 
um, stay safe, please, because we need you on the other side. So thanks. Hey folks, uh, Chato, she, her, hers. Um, so if I may, um, and shout out to two of the most awesome commissioners on the call who are doing such great work in Miami. Thank you, um, Commissioner uh, Danielle and Commissioner Eileen. Um, okay, so I am I'm really sticking, one of the things, incredible panel, Christina, incredible panelists, one of the things that's really stuck out with me is when you mentioned Liz abolish ICE. And I'm just thinking about what an incredible time it is to be really pushing that conversation in a time when court rulings are coming back on the inhumaneness of these detention centers, when we're just, and I'm just, I wanna uplift that, the importance of pushing that and having like that narrative, right? Like I know that we're, you know, we are surviving and we still have to have space to dream, right? Post recovery, post COVID recovery. And I'm wondering, right, besides just like a yes, awesome, incredible, yes, snap, snap, uh, how can we continue to add to that narrative as individuals, as organizations? Because it, it is something that I, I might not be seeing a lot of because we're so busy surviving that we're not thinking this bigger thing of like, yeah, I was not a thing, right? Um, so thinking more than just surviving now, how we can dream. I can jump in really quick and then I don't know if Sandra or Oscar or don't, anybody, I, I saw movement for the, for the comments. Oh, and Danielle. <laughs> um, just really quickly to say that I think this is where we get to really sit in our shared humanity and the only way for us to um, take on systems that, that in, like by definition dehumanize us is to call that out. Um, and I think that this situation of uh, the literal lives, right, the mortality of folks who are incarcerated in jails, prisons, and detention centers are um, like morally reprehensible, actually. Um, and I think that we are on the right side of history, on the right side of justice in that. And I think by going back to our humanity and the humanity of folks that are incarcerated, um, we can win. <laughs> and Daniela, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Yes, yes. I'm sorry I'm late. I obviously missed an incredible conversation. So if it's recorded, I definitely yeah. want to hear it. Yeah. Uh, I had kind of a rough day. Uh, we had an earned leave uh, piece of legislation that went down in flames. And all the more reason that we need to do the kinds of things that I hear everybody talking about. Um, so I just want to say, like, looking through the gallery, I know some of you, but I don't know all of you. And that gives me hope. <laughs> like, yes, we're building a cadre of new activism here in Miami-Dade County. I'm so excited. And of course, to my colleague, Eileen, who like me was an activist before she was an elected official. So, uh, you know, hats off to you. And just, I wanna reflect too, like we created this Office of New Americans. You know, it's like really one of the best things that I got to do as county commissioner. And we were so, so smart when we brought Christina on board, right? So smart. And looking at this document that you put together, like, yes, that's it. It's like, it's not just about naturalization. It's about all of these human rights issues that you document here and building the excitement and the momentum. Uh, I was interviewed earlier tonight by SAVE for their panel on the mayor's race. And they asked me about the ICE detainers and you know why I feel so strongly that that is wrong just so 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 very wrong and uh, so I'm thinking I, again I have to go back and listen to all the great things that everybody said but I'm thinking for sure we want to publicize all of the next steps that are outlined and really promote sponsoring a new American I, I really think that's such a beautiful idea and um, just a great way to to um, live into our humanity to sponsor a new American. So sign me up. I'm ready to sponsor a new American, yeah. ready to, and, and for everybody that I do not yet know who's on the call, please reach out. I really would love to know you. And of course, as mayor, this will be a top priority for me. We will give welcome. We will make sure that it's not just lip service, that we really are honoring and protecting uh, all of the people who are here by choice because how special is that? They're here by choice. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Christina.
Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and yes, yeah, so for those of you that don't know, ONA was created by County <laughs> by Commissioner uh, yes, yes. Kama, um, back in 2015. It feels like a yes. lifetime ago, like I can't yeah. in January. But <laughs> yeah. I, um, really, it was uh, the leadership of the County Commission and um, Commissioner Danielle as our champion to to make sure that we actually have a space in in local government um, quasi that it may be to <laughs> to be able to lift up the issues of our immigrant community and that's one of the reasons why we are able to have forums like this and yeah. uh, speak a little truth to power when we can yeah. and, and and it was a city initiative city bank city that was around the country and it was in cities and we were the first county and I don't know there's probably no other county still so. Yeah. Yeah, it was really a great, it was a great opportunity that we had. So thank you, but thank you for making it come to life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so Christina, I did want to share a little more love for you too. Um, I think you've done a phenomenal <laughs> job. Any ideas that we have, um, you're so creative and always looking for ways to engage the community, use technology. I mean, what you've done in the last couple of months, rethinking citizenship and, um, trying to communicate the issues to our local community. I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Oh, you guys. <laughs> um, but no, I, I honestly, I fundamentally believe in connecting people in need to the resources that exist and creating paths that don't exist. Um, and so doing this work with all of you is like so fulfilling. And also um, you all are like on the ground day to day. And so I, if there's any chance for me to create a platform, I will create it. Um, and I'm excited for what's to come um, in the future and using this opportunity with um, COVID to actually bring folks together that may normally not work together and folks who normally may not be interested in this issue, um, which I think was also the ethos of 10 Days of Connection. So, oh, I think that's the chat. Um, if there are any, we have about three minutes left before we start wrapping up, because I do want to respect people's time and it's late and we're on Zoom all day. Um, so any other burning thoughts, any issues to lift up that we may not have discussed? Um, now is the time and then I can go on to how you can connect with all of us and some next steps. Because we're all about action. <laughs> Going once, going twice. Okay, so I'm going to share how I'm going to bring our PowerPoint back up. Okay, so how can you connect with all of us? So one of the things that we really focused on this year for 10 Days of Connection was not just that we have a great conversation and then go away from each other and reflect back on that great time that we had for two hours and and uh, never do anything about it again. So. First, I want to make sure that you all know where you can find the lovely folks who have been leading this conversation. So Adonia is at Americans for Immigrant Justice. Um, I will be sharing the PowerPoint as well as the recording for folks who had RSVP. So uh, stay tuned for that. And it'll also be on Ono's website. Oscar Londonio with We Count, their fearless leader. Um, U-Turn Consulting, Sher uh, Shirley is an amazing youth advocate and always bringing um, the real the realness to the conversation. <laughs> uh, myself, you can find me at Office of New Americans in Miami Dade. Uh, Sandra, the interim ED of Miami Workers Center, another fearless leader, and also board member of ONA. I guess I, I get to do a plug for that. And uh, Liz, who is the founder of Pulso, and is also a board member of ONA. We have a really, really great leadership, I can say. Um, so what can you do next now that we've had this juicy conversation? So we have a couple of events that we've uh, lifted up and some action items. So tomorrow, actually, at 6 p.m., AIJ is going to be hosting a myth-busting myth trivia night. I'm excited. I don't know if you're excited, but that'll be fun. Um, there is, uh, starting on Monday, we are going to be holding um, a weekly Facebook Live, where we go through relief resources and public charge with um, AIJ, the Florida Immigrant Coalition, and Community Medical Group. Um, and we are going to be focusing on what resources are actually available for immigrants 
and what relief options you have that do not threaten your immigration status and um, was available for undocumented folks. So that will be happening on Monday. Check out our ONA Facebook page. It'll be live and recorded 1 o'clock to 2.30 every Monday for the month of May. Um, it's going to be in English, Spanish, and Creole because we are living our values about language access. Um, so the Protecting Immigrant Families National uh, Collaborative has a webinar for folks um, on state policy options for an immigrant inclusive uh, COVID-19 response. We talked about a lot about that on the call, but there are gonna be some best practices there and a deeper dive on Tuesday at 1 p.m. Um, so Asian, uh, there's a really great documentary, which I got to see a sneak peek of, um, by PBS on the history of Asian Americans. And it's going to be airing on PBS, on your local PBS station, on Monday and Tuesday of next week at 8 p.m. Um, we are also in Asian Heritage Month. It is Asian Heritage Month, so we are highlighting that. It is also Haitian Heritage Month, so say to my peoples. Uh, you will say Asian American. Um, if you have any, any legal needs in terms of uh, your immigration status, you can contact AIJ for um, legal services. They are providing legal services. Um, next week, Wednesday, ONA is going to be announcing virtual citizenship assistance. Um, so we know that we can't stop making sure that our people get the services that they need. And so we're adapting to the times and uh, we're gonna be offering that in partnership with the Florida Immigrant Coalition. We Count, as we've highlighted, has a super important um, immigrant worker COVID relief fund. Um, they need our support. So if you are sharing your check um, as I like to say, in sharing your relief check or wanting to pay it forward, please, please donate to um, the COVID relief fund that WeCount has. I know that there are actually, there's some other um, mutual aid funds. So I would say take the time to like spend two seconds on Facebook and search mutual aid in your search bar and you will see that there are um, mutual aid funds led by community uh, concerned citizens, I should say, um, who want to make sure that their fellow community members are okay during this time. As we know, um, mutual aid is not in, re it is a stopgap for um, federal assistance dollars that folks are not able to access, including unemployment funds. Um, are there any other calls to actions or plugs that folks want to make? I know that there's some action going on in the chat. Um, Lily, do you want to jump on and talk about um, the detention reporting? Yeah, so um, in light of the rapidly changing conditions and in, in the three immigration facilities here in South Florida right now, AIJ started a conditions hotline um, where we're open five days a week to take reports um, on what's happening in the facilities, either from folks who are detained or even their family members or others who are in touch. Um, it's same AIJ number, but extension 1460. And then we can also take down any names for people who are detained and need legal consults right now. Thank you so much. That is crucial right now. Um, Okay, so the hours are in the chat. The number is in the chat. Um, I will make sure to pull that out and post that with our recap email. Um, I know that Commissioner Higgins said that if there is, if you, if folks need support, to reach out to her district office. Um, and we also have uh, the Black Collective has a mutual aid fund for residents of Liberty City and Little Haiti. So if you know folks in Little Haiti or Liberty City that need immediate assistance in terms of getting food or um, supplies, have them apply. Um, and LadyFest also has a mutual aid fund <laughs> um, for folks that need some stabilization funds. Um, so how can you support? Because like we were saying before, everybody has a role to play. Um, and so here are some actionable steps that you personally can take. So one is uh, advocate for, and if you're in a decision-making power, approve municipal, um, uh, municipal emergency assistance funding for excluded groups. Um, 
you can donate to a mutual aid fund, which we plugged a lot just now. You can support an immigrant powered business. We have, so if you go to immigrantpowered.org, there are, uh, there's more information about our campaign. Basically it's a decal campaign where businesses sign up and proudly own that they are immigrant powered and we do features on them. And it's a wide variety of businesses from, from, uh, catering to tech to comms to like florists like we, we've got it all because we are um like i said the engine behind our local economy and uh you can provide covid related information and resources in other languages um besides english so if you do know another language volunteer your time and talent to help translate materials out there um and one of the things too is if you are in a position of leadership where information is being communicated live, um, please take the time to find somebody who can also uh, interpret into Creole particularly. I know there's been a really big gap around that. Um, and then one of the key asks is to, as we consider opening up, whatever opening up looks like, um, we need to make sure that essential workers, particularly in agriculture and the service sector, have the proper productive equipment that they need for them to be able to do their jobs. Um, they are out there so that we can stay home. And the very least that we can do is make sure that they have the proper gear that they need to not get sick. And last but not least, Resources as promised. So here's a list of resources, policy best practices, best practices and policy recommendations, FAQs in terms of what um, assistance you may be eligible for depending on your immigration status. It's available in both um, Spanish and, and English and we're gonna work on Creole. And uh, that's about it. Final thoughts? Thank you, thank you so much for joining and for having this like robust conversation. And I am feeling inspired in knowing that we are not doing this work alone. And I think that is the main point. Um, and thank you so much to Radical Partners for holding down uh, 10 days of connection despite us being physically distant. Uh, and I will hope to see you soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Great job, everybody. Thank Stay you well. Thank you for all your work. Bye. Thank you. Bye.